the society of meetings. Before I introduce Professor Jim Johns, I first want to recognize Steve Millett, one of the co-founders and co-directors of the Cleanup Society. Steve has a PhD from the History Department of Ohio State, and he's been instrumental in helping the department figure out how to reach alumni in a variety of different ways. So uh, welcome, Steve, to share a couple of remarks with you, Steve. Uh, thank you, Peter. Hi, I'm Steve Millett, uh, PhD in 1972, which to my memory doesn't sound so terribly long ago, but when I looked at the camera, I thought, how's that possible? So I was one of those PhDs who uh, left the academic world. I worked uh, at Patel for 27 years um, and uh, have since retired and come back. And the purpose of the Cleo Society is uh, if you loved history as an undergraduate, you're going to love it now. Now is the time uh, when people have an opportunity to uh, maybe do some more independent reading, uh, reflect on historical subjects. And the university has always had a mission of continuous education, but we kind of left that to every individual to pursue for himself or herself. But this is a program that provides opportunities uh, for continuous uh, learning, lifetime learning, uh, for us who are retired, but also for undergraduates uh, and faculty members and, and the broader community. So this is very much an outreach program. The Cleo Society would not be at all possible if it were not for the Goldberg Center. And David Staley is the director of the Goldberg Center and does a brilliant job of, of uh, managing that. The Goldberg Center was made possible through donations to the department. And it's been dedicated to excellence in teaching and outreach. So it was a perfect dovetail uh, to uh, have the Cleo Society as an aspect of the outreach mission uh, of the Goldberg Center. And I'm very impressed with uh, what the center and David have been able to do. Uh, there's certainly their work in excellence of teaching has, has had uh, effects on them, very positive effects on the history department. Uh, and I think that it is also successful in reaching a broader interests among undergraduates uh, as well. Um, when I make my donation uh, to the Ohio State University, I designate the Goldberg Center as the object of my donation. If I like to know it's going for something that I'm involved in, it's personal. So um, David has the code number for the Goldberg Center, and if any of you are, are making your annual donations and would like to, to go to something that you're involved with, I highly recommend the Goldberg Center. Thank you very much for showing up this morning, and I think we're going to have a very stimulating uh, morning. Thank you, Steve, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Ian <coughs> the uh, Cleo Society presenter this morning. Ying joined us a couple of years ago after finishing her PhD at the University of Michigan in history. The script says I should pause, so <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <Great. laughs> Prior to uh, studying in Michigan, she earned a BA at Redmond University of China, an MA at Osaka in Japan, another MA at the University of Cincinnati in Women's Studies, and then on to Michigan for PhD. We're delighted to have her here on the faculty. Uh, she's a, an emerging scholar. She's published an article in Feminist Studies. She's now completing her uh, revisions of her dissertation into a book manuscript on um, Confucian thoughts in early identity politics in early modern China, uh, a topic she might touch on today in her remarks. She also is a well-regarded lecturer in the national environment. She's given papers at both the American Historical Association annual and the American Academy of Religion annual meeting, and for an assistant professor to be speaking in those venues, uh, two major venues like that is truly impressive. She's also been invited to give talks at such universities as UCLA, Michigan, uh, Brown, and Harvard. Um, and indeed, that's a marker for distinction, emerging distinction as well. This morning, she's going to talk on this topic with the King of China, question mark. Uh, I'm sure she'll uh, uh, raise and complicate that question for your thinking. Uh, she's going to speak for a little while and welcome your questions. We have an hour and a half set aside for our event, and we can stay and discuss and talk as long as uh, there's, there's interest out there. So please join me in welcoming Professor Zhang. Thank you, Peter. Some of my thoughts and observations 
as a historian and to uh, kind of use a topic to um, uh, to discuss uh, the role that the academic historians could play in educating um, the public and uh, facilitate construct, constructive conversation about contemporary issues and historical questions. Um, and I, re I always, I lecture, of course, to my undergraduate students, and I, I give lectures and talks uh, in academic meeting, uh, settings, but it's very rare for, for me, uh, because I'm a historian of China, to give opportunity, to uh, have an opportunity to talk to an uh, interesting audience like this. And so I really look forward to hearing your, uh, your feedback and uh, our uh, conversation after my, my talk. So I chose uh, this um, topic it's, um, intellectually, it is very, very important and exciting. Uh, and uh, because the Qing China, the dynasty, uh, the last dynasty in the Chinese imperial history, um, was a very successful empire. Uh, but traditionally, in the Chinese, what we call Confucian, uh, historiographical tradition, it, had, it was described as one, uh, not just another Chinese dynasty, a lot of historical research written about the Qing dynasty um, uh, was framed in Confucian way, in a very in a very Chinese way. So, in the past two decades, historians in both China and in the United States they started to think about the Qing history in a different way, and there emerged a new subfield or a new approach called the New Qing History. Scholars, especially in um, when uh, some some um, a couple of uh, universities in China, such as uh, the, the national, uh, the central um, uh, ethnic university, um, and, uh, and and a group of scholars in the United States, uh, they started to pay a lot more attention to historical sources written in a language other than Chinese, uh, uh, such as Mandarin. So they could better understand what was going on at the time and the um, emperorship uh, in the Qing dynasty um, and uh, the changes and continuities happened to the Chinese imperial system. Um, however, in this process, they were because the, the scholars have started to emphasize the, the particularity of the Qing dynasty and the Manchu rule because this dynasty was ruled by a non, what we call a non-Han uh, uh, ruling house. I am Han. Uh, it's a majority of the Chinese population, but there are populations with different ethnic, uh, ethnic background in China today, in, as in history and in contemporary China. Uh, so um, they started to emphasize that uh, this ruling house and this dynasty uh, was a uh, multi-ethnic empire, and the, the ruling house and the ruling, some of the ruling elite really started to uh, they really emphasize a, a different identity, like a Manchu identity, an ethnic dimension of the empire. So um, while scholars were debating about these things and making um, uh, scholarly arguments about this history, uh, of course, the public was also paying attention, uh, and uh, the scholars outside of his, history uh, discipline of history and general reading public starting to react uh, react to this this intellectual debate in very interesting ways, which I will um, talk about uh, in my uh, talk today. So I I, I cite uh, this scholar, um, uh, one of the representative historians of New Chinese history. Here, the article she wrote for the uh, Wall Street Journal uh, two years ago, uh, not because I don't like her as a scholar. I admire her research. Uh, I don't, I, 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 I shouldn't mention her name, uh, but I admire her research. I think she's a wonderful scholar, and uh, in my own research, I cite her scholarship. She's one of the new Qing historians, and in this article, she, um, she talks about the history of Chinese empire and especially the Qing Empire. And then what happened to this empire, to the territories occupied by the Qing Empire in modern China, in Republic of China, and what the Chinese Communist, uh, Republic of China 
it's describing the historical community um, uh, in uh, contemporary discourse. So the reason I'm citing these two sentences is because uh, they touch upon some of the things I will discuss today. First, she said, China is part of the Qing Empire, ruled by foreign invaders, the Manchus. Okay, so I think it is true that this, this land we often identify as China. Maybe this part was part of the Qing Empire. What we identify as the territory of the People, People's Republic of China now um, is smaller than the territory used to be occupied by the Qing Empire. And it is also true that the, this, this empire was ruled not by the Han Chinese, but by, by the Manchus. However, the Chinese actively participated in the, in, the, in the Qing government. So the problem with this sentence is, what is China? Because at the time, China was Qing, and Qing was China. And I will talk about this um, um, in, in more detail soon. And next sentence, she said, the, the People's Republic of China promotes this discourse that basically um, claims the Chinese nationalism that consists of all the end of the resentment against real wrongs done to China by foreign invaders and imperialists in the past. Glorification of a genuinely distinct literary, artistic, and philosophical tradition of some 4,000 years of duration, fictive narratives of political and geographical continuity of the Chinese Empire for that same period and, and the circuitous uh, claims to dominate the former Qing Empire uh, territories of Manchuria, Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Tibet, and Taiwan. And you probably have noticed what recently happened to this discussion about Xinjiang because of this, um, this attack at Tiananmen Square just recently. So the things that I highlighted red letters are what I think uh, worth discussing. First of all, it is, I think she admits, uh, and many scholars agree that um, um, China really went through this very chaotic period uh, um, and uh, a crisis uh, because of the foreign invasions and imperialist attempts uh, by the West in 19th century and early 20th century. Um, however, here, she's, and, and many other scholars seem to want to make a distinction between what we call the Chinese civilization and the political and geographical structure of the Chinese empire. And it is here that we, I think we should discuss more. Because in the Chinese ideology, um, um, you cannot completely separate the moral discourse, the political discourse, the government, the family. And basically, you cannot se separate civilization completely from, your, uh, from, the, from the state, from the government, and from the whole social structure. So everything it was basically entangled together. So why uh, it is quite modern, and uh, uh, I would say not very um, Chinese to separate these things so clearly in this, in this discourse. So, now I'm going to talk about the Qing history, and then I will talk about what happened to the Qing Empire when it was over, um, was, uh, when the, the, the Republic of China was established in the early 20th century. So the Qing Empire lasted from 1644 to 1911. This map shows how it, it expanded. So it was established in here as part of the, um, actually the, the previous dynasty, what we how the main dynasty established and ruled by the Han Chinese um, um, had established some administrative um, uh, structure in Manchuria. And, uh, um, and uh, the, the, the ruling of the um, elite, uh, the Manchus, um, recognized by this Han Chinese dynasty, they gradually it, it expanded their territory and control. Okay? From here, Gradually to northeast more, and then um, to the southwest toward what we usually call China proper, but it, again, it's a very problematic term as well. 
far. So um, this empire replaced the previous Chinese empire, the Ming Dynasty, in the year of 1644. <coughs> um, and by 1644, it had occupied a huge land uh, in northern China and uh, Manchuria. And then after 1644, it started to uh, be, uh, launch its uh, southern campaign to conquer the whole China. So by the, the end of the 17th century, it has basically um, occupied the territory um, claimed by the previous Chinese dynasty. And then in the next century or so, it started to extend um, <coughs> to north, um, northward and northward. So um, it's in very different ways. It controlled uh, what we call Mongolia and Xinjiang and then and then Tibet. Okay, so this is a, a brief history of the establishment and expansion of the Qing Empire. So first of all, um, for those of you who are not familiar with Chinese history, I want to briefly talk about who the Manchus are. Were they really that different? Like, Significantly different from the Chinese. If so, in what way? If not, in what ways? And then we can talk about um, how they ruled the Qing the, 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 uh, the Empire. So, first, let's think about what happened before 1644 when the Manchus came to uh, Beijing and replaced the, uh, the Chinese, um, previous Chinese dynasty. So, uh, the, the very traditional historical narrative. Describe them as the barbarians, nine Chinese barbarians, less civilized and nomad, even nomadic. Still, I think a lot of textbooks describe them as nomadic people, but actually that was not true. So, um, first of all, they had already established their own their, their, their state, and they've learned so much from the Chinese and from here. And and in terms of the mode of production and economic structure and lifestyle, uh, with its expansion. The Qing state actually, or the Manchus, they actually absorbed a lot of Chinese territory and Chinese population. And uh, their economy consists of uh, sort of traditional hunting, gathering, to uh, agriculture, different kinds of agricultural activity, and the trade, uh, such as uh, in uh, furs and the ginseng. Um, so it was not really a nomadic society. Uh, and uh, uh, there were many Chinese living in that area as well. So they were not as barbarian and nomadic as uh, has traditionally described in the dominant narrative. And then, of course, when it established its own um, state um, and eventually its own dynasty, it borrowed a lot from the tradition, traditional Confucian ideology, Confucian, Confucianism, as in Confucianism. So first of all, uh, in, terms, in the process of state formation, the Manchus claimed they now had the uh, they now had the mandate of heaven, a key concept in Confucian um, um, uh, ideology. Uh, basically, uh, each dynasty claimed uh, it now replaced the previous dynasty because uh, the mandate of heaven had been transferred to the next legitimate ruler. So it adopted the, uh, the same the same method, and then. Uh, first of all, first it established itself as a dynasty called the Latter Jin, and then it um, changed the name into Qing. Uh, it used the Chinese character as the as the uh, as the empire's name. So again, this is very Chinese Confucian um, um, practice, uh, so that this the state could create um, a continuous um, past, and then uh, through historical writing. Through this kind of uh, uh, the creating this image, uh, uh, imperial image for itself, it, it actually created a reality of um, um, as a legitimate empire. So, and then next, in terms of government and official recruitment of officials, the the Manchus, even before 1644, they had already started selective examinations. The 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 sort of the um, standard feature of the, of the Confucian. State um, and uh, and then recruited officials through examinations. Many of them had to study Confucian classics. Of course, that was the only not the only channel to which officials were recruited. But uh, the, 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 the Manchu state did try to 
um, floral, um, uh, all these practices from the Chinese tradition. And then in terms of cultural strategies, this is a little more complicated because um, they they experienced they experimented a lot. And then because of the uh, the changing political, social, economic situation, especially at the time it was part of this global 17th century <coughs> crisis, and uh, the climate change also affected state formation and uh, um, and uh, political situation in both. Um, main dynasty and uh, the, the nephew um, state. So, um, political situation kept changing. Its cultural strategies also uh, sort of remain flexible. Um, first of all, um, it, the, the, the Manchu state did try to translate a lot of Chinese material into uh, into Manchu to help educate its elite. And then, uh, in some time, sometimes it encouraged people to assimilate. Um, but then, when the there were conflicts, and uh, when social economic situations and politically started to get a little um, volatile and chaotic, they tried to separate this population. So basically, the Manchu state experimented with all kinds of uh, um, methods to control the population and the territory. Okay. So this <coughs> uh, uh, the sort of the, the, the brief review of the state formation before 1644, and then. People are astonished that the Manchus were um, so successful in their military conquest. Um, and uh, again, um, I always tell uh, my students and uh, uh, my colleagues in um, other fields that the Manchu um, soldiers were not, you know, these um, soldiers waving swords and riding the horses uh, coming to in China. That is not the, the powerful Manchu soldiers. It's much more complicated than that. Actually, well, when we think of a Manchu soldiers, these are images that would come up, come to our mind. But actually, um, they are already they were exposed to new technologies, new military strategies, and this is a painting depicting a battle between the main army and uh, the Manchu army. So here on the main side, you see this very primitive uh, firearm, and then of course the traditional weapons like the bows and uh, swords, and then uh, the, uh, the soldiers uh, were um, imitating cavalry. And, and, and then here on the military side, uh, you see you know sort of still the mounted soldiers and traditional traditional uh, uh, weapons, and then the matches were quickly. Adapt, adapt, uh, adapting to the new um, sort of new um, uh, military technology, and then when they expanded, when they expanded into more Chinese territory, they, they studied the the, uh, the landscape very carefully, and then they designed the military strategies before a battle very carefully. They they tried to figure out where they could use the uh, the mounted soldiers, where they use the infantry, and where they could station some of the uh, firearms like panels they had obtained. From um, the Chinese. So here you see a sea channel in the year, uh, in the year of 1626. Um, so they are already using uh, more advanced te technology uh, in their in their battles. So again, the the Manchus were not <laughs> nomadic people riding horses with these words coming to conquer China. That's a misunderstanding of um, their strength. And then, of course. One historian of military history of China uh, famously asked, "Did guns matter during this period in the Manchu conquest of China?" Uh, and the answer is actually, guns did matter, and not just for the Chinese Han Chinese, but also for the Manchu as well, because they really incorporated a new uh, technology, a new military strategy into their military uh, power. And then lastly, they uh, organized their society and the, uh, and, the, and the army in, a, in an elite system called the banner system. There were eight banners, and actually some of them were Han Chinese, and some of them were Mongolian, uh, and then some of them were Manchu, and they had different divisions of uh, labor. And uh, it's a very effective way to integrate the political, social, um, and, uh, um, and cultural control. Um, one system. Okay, so when the Manchus came to China and quickly conquered the northern China, um, the Chinese were already tired of rebellions and 
mix the management of the government and all this natural disaster chaos for so many years. So many have often actually sort of accepted the fact that now we're going to have a new dynasty. And I will talk about this concept of, that, of dynastic cycle um, in heaven uh, soon. So they, um, many of them didn't try to do this. They just thought, well, now the man in the heaven is with a different ruling house, a different dynasty, and let's just accept this fact. Okay, so when the, um, so when the Manchu started to conquer more Chinese territory, they became very confident. And then they, um, one year after they, um, they entered Beijing, they um, started to carry out this, implement this policy of head shaving in a more strict way. It was implemented, and then the Chinese resisted, so it was kind of stopped for some time, and then they restored, restored this policy. So this policy really uh, provoked very, very violent and strong reactions from the Chinese. Because um, um, <coughs> they think that actually this, this policy was designed to um, sort of uh, to make sure everyone understood now it's a new dynasty um, and uh, uh, there's this hierarchy between the Manchus and the Chinese and the Chinese should um, accept the fact that um, they are subjects, ruling subjects, ruled mm -hmm. by the, the Manchus. Okay, so um, so this is the man's uh, uh, hairstyle in the main dynasty. This is the official, he was wearing a, a hat, but if you look at his cap, you will be able to see this kind of hairstyle. So they didn't shave, they just cut the hair. And now this is the hairstyle I'm talking in the Qing dynasty. So they had to shave their forehead and then uh, make a pretty beard. And this is a, a barber. Um, so um, I would say um, this, this policy was meant to make sure there's no ambiguity about um, who was the, the Manchus were the ruling house of uh, the Chinese. So, um, and I think this is um, this is an ethnic gesture, but it's most most important thing, like for Chinese a political um, gesture as well. So we cannot just say it was uh, you know a kind of ethnic discrimination, of, um, but I, I think the Chinese interpreted that as a political. Um, a wrong political policy, problematic political policy as well. Okay, so after this very violent um, conquest, uh, so many millions of people died uh, in this conquest, and there are plenty of um, uh, testimonies composed by Chinese themselves to describe the, the violence uh, during this period. So once the Manchus consolidated the, the empire, the Chinese themselves started to pledge loyalty to the to the Man, the, the, the Qing Empire. So when some um, warlords decided that um, they didn't want to uh, want to be ruled uh, by the by the Qing anymore, they they rose up and organized the rebellions. This the famous rebellions happened in late 17th century. Um, and then the Chinese themselves decided that they were going to stand with the Manchus. So they, they joined the, the campaigns against the um, warlords and eventually, um, and this is a very uh, significant event in the Qing history because now the Chinese <coughs> themselves um, they completely identified with this this Manchu um, empire. Okay, so the the Manchu empire was very successful in many many ways. For, what, although it inherited the system from the Ming Dynasty, um, they actually significantly reform the whole system and make it more efficient. Um, but they are much better at making money. So <laughs> a lot of these social economic changes actually can trend, continue from the main to, to the to the chain dynasty. Um, and it, I, I should say something about the trade. Uh, in, uh, uh, most of the years in the Ming Dynasty, the Ming adopted a relatively rigid attitude toward trade, and they wanted to control, to make sure all the trade with foreign countries, other people's tributary, in, uh, would happen within the tributary system. Um, uh, and they didn't encourage, and actually declared illegal uh, uh, to conduct the trade uh, privately. And then it proved to be very problematic, and um, a lot of conflicts in northwestern, today's northwestern China, along the east coast, uh, happened at the time, including the famous 
so-called Japanese heresy. Um, so, and eventually they decided, oh, well, we can't keep this policy anymore, so they'd open it up eventually. And the Qing dynasty came to power, it really encouraged this international trade and, and all that. So that's a change in attitude, but continue the trend. So what I highlighted here are the major uh, sort of changes happened in, in the period. Uh, first of all, it tightened an implementation of regulation. The change, the change previous dynasty was not as, you know, as a kind of relaxed attitude toward this. And then the, the end of the main dynasty, previous dynasty, they started to sell some of the degrees of office or office to those who couldn't pass the civil service examination. But it was very low scale. Uh, mostly, the officials still had to study the official classics and pass the examination and then on the office. So in the chain, they started to sell more office. Uh, and then, but still, you know, at the beginning of 18th century, their income from this selling of office was pretty low. And then, look at this number. So it, just within um, two decades, it quickly rose to to uh, almost five million tails of silver. So that's one of the ways that the dimension made, made money. And Chinese uh, traditional Confucian government probably would not do this because it'd be, we need in the moral education of the, the of the of men uh, and, and those qualified for the government. And another uh, interesting thing uh, in the Qing dynasty is that they established this institution in their household department. And then um, they even established an imperial cup shop and, and to make sure the imperial <coughs> would have enough revenue. So, um, so basically the Manchus, they were, um, they had a different attitude toward, uh, um, you know, sort of making money, making the country rich. And the Chinese the Confucians were always suspicious of this. Uh, their primary concern was the moral uh, cultivation of the population and the maintaining the right order in society, in the family, and in, 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 the, in the government. But I think the chain uh, was more, uh, actually was more interested uh, in, in making money. Um, okay, so, and then we can look at the Qing Empire and, uh, and, uh, and the emperors. So, the, the Qing as I said before, expanded uh, its territory to and it conquered, it basically uh, continually um, uh, controlled Taiwan in late 17th century, and then um, it expanded to Upper uh, Mongolia um, and then uh, Xinjiang and then and then Tibet, and they ruled this, these territories, these territories in very very different ways, not in the same way. They tried to adapt to. Uh, sort of different situations uh, at the time. All right. And then, in different regions, they adopted different cultural policy. In the former territories occupied in the, Chinese, the, the, former, the, the main dynasty, they encouraged the non-Chinese to integrate, to, to, um, to, to learn from the Chinese culture, and to be uh, assimilated into the Chinese culture. But in the new territories, they encouraged people to uh, preserve their own traditions. And then in terms of the self-image of the emperor, emperor, they tried to describe themselves as not only the emperor of the Chinese, but also the universal monarch. So this is one of the portraits of the uh, of Qing emperor, and he's using a brush, and he, although he's wearing the Qing uh, clothes, he actually looks like a um, uh, like Chinese literate, literate. And this is an official portrait of the general emperor, and he looks like a Manchu Qing uh, ruler. And then here's a, a portrait. Uh, he looks like um, he's actually uh, being portrayed as a, 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 a Bodhisattva um, in Tibetan Buddhism. So he's using this. The, all, they're using all these images to portray themselves as not just the emperor, but one people, but also a universal <coughs> monarch. And I, as I said before, I just want to quickly sort of uh, emphasize that they, throughout the rule, they emphasize cultural uh, uh, assimilation in some population, among some population, but also uh, encourage uh, people to preserve their own culture. Uh, and then one thing that really concerned the Manchu emperors was uh, how to maintain a Manchu identity. 
So we have to realize that at, at, on one hand, they did make a lot of efforts to maintain their independence, uh, their financial identity. On the other hand, uh, this was becoming more difficult as the Manchu and Chinese and Han Chinese and many other people were becoming one big society. And then Beijing became a major center for publishing in multiple languages. Uh, there were a lot of uh, translation Confucian classics into other languages, and then some of the translation publications were bilingual, and then in trilingual and quadrilingual. And uh, you see these different languages here. Um, I have an example. Um, this is the famous, uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Beijing, famous Lama Temple, Yonghong Gong. Um, and um, um, Buddhism, uh, 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 Buddhism, and then see the tablet at the entrance of the Yonghe Gong. We have four languages um, in the name of the of the of the temple, written in four languages: four languages, Chinese, uh, Mongolian, um, um, uh, 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 um, and uh, uh, Tibetan, and uh, uh, and Manchu. And then here's um, a memorial to so the, the document uh, that. Um, the official submitted to the emperor, uh, to the emperor Qianlong actually. Um, so you see this document written in Manchu, okay? obviously submitted by a Manchu official, and then you see the emperor correcting him in red ink in Manchu. However, you see him also writing in Chinese in the red comments. So it's, 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 this document itself is uh, it's bilingual. Okay, and then in, and, and, and the, the Qing Empire really had to continue to use Confucian um, ideology to organize society. And uh, one of the very effective ways is to um, ask the local people to memorize what is, what is called secret eating. Basically, they uh, incorporate, this, incorporate this Confucian message about promoting female piety, uh, taking care of your parents and respecting your elder brothers. In social order uh, and all that, and, and ask the local educated man to uh, recite this to the villagers repeatedly, regularly, uh, as a, a way of being indoctrinated on the population. And also, in terms of gender and sexuality, this the policies and, the idea, and ideas, it continued the Confucian tradition and even uh, sort of uh, actually helped popularize some Confucian, very specific Confucian practices in, um, in Chinese society. Okay, so they actually, in during the Qing dynasty, they visited the Confucius temple, this Confucius temple in Beijing, much more often than the Han Chinese emperor. Uh, and it just really showed interest in using Confucian ideology to create self-image. So, um, so what happened in 1912? The, 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 um, obviously, the empire was in decline and faced tremendous crisis, and there was people wanted to change the political system. So eventually, in the year of 1912, after uh, several months after this, this um, rebellion or right, right up in southern China, the emperor and uh, uh, empress daughter the dowager decided that they were going to give up the, the rule, and they got some really uh, some uh, the promise from the uh, the chain, the chain uh, um, uh, new <coughs> leaders that they will be treat, treated well. Okay, so this is a postcard issue to remember this application in 1912. So it was kind of a peaceful transfer of power from a, a Chinese empire. Of empire to a Chinese republic. Okay, so how do we understand, how do we understand this transfer, uh, tra uh, transfer of power? If we think about it, if if this was not that Chinese empire, it would have been imagined in a completely different way. First of all, traditionally, the Chinese hold, held unification as an ideal. So if you know something about the Chinese literature, you might you may have heard of this, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. This is the beginning line of that novel, and it captures, it really, it really captures how the Chinese imagine their own government. When an empire has long been divided, it must be united. When it's long been united, it will be divided. So the Chinese really believe in this. If you look at the Chinese imperial history, out of the, 
the old, a little over 2,000 years. Actually, most of the U.S. Chinese were not unified. So this is kind of a myth and ideal. Um, and then out of the 15 unification, 14 of them originated in the, in the north, and many of them were unified by the Chinese. So this unification, um, this, 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 this is a fiction that every dynasty participated in, believing in a unified empire. They believe in the concept of the real kingdom, and they believe that a legitimate uh, dynasty carried the magic of heaven. So now let's look at the dynasties and ruling houses. I'm listing the most um, the, 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 the most important dynasties and ruling houses here. Um, and then you can see it's very hard to say what China meant at the time. Each dynasty was different. In the Tang dynasty, the Chinese always think of it as glorious period in imperial history. Actually, it was ruled by a house that was not purely Han. It was a kind of uh, mixed of ethnic background. And then the next year, the five dynasties and ten kingdoms, basically some of the states were established by the Han people and some are not, not Han. And then the Song dynasty, ruled by the Han, ruling house. And Yuan dynasty, part of the Mongol Empire. Ruled by the Mongols. And then the Ming Dynasty, ruled by the Han. And then the Qing Dynasty, ruled by the Ventures. So China was always called one of these dynasties and ruled by either Chinese or Han Chinese or non Han Chinese. So this is the, um, so when I, sometimes when I look at this, I, you know, I, I wonder if, if there was, it was really a China. Uh, and I asked my students, um, is, after I talk about all these things, do you think there's still a Chinese civilization? They said, yes, yes, there is. And they still want to talk about China. Um, and this, let's look at territory. So obviously, Chinese territory has always changed if we, we think there was a China. Chinese territory is never the same, okay? Always change. Sometimes it's smaller, sometimes it's bigger, okay? So the dynasties change, and ruling houses change, and territories has always changed. And this is the territory when the, the government, the state, uh, was now sort of the so-called Man of Heaven. Many people at the time still believe in Man of Heaven, transferred from the Qing Empire to the Republic of China. Okay? And then in, uh, in the mid-1940s, uh, Mongolia declared independence and it was recognized by, by the later Chinese government. So this is the territory of uh, people to probably in China today. So if we think of the fall of the Qing China in the theory of dynastic cycle, it's just another dynastic transition. Um, so things continue uh, and different ruling house and uh, whatever you take over, territory, structure, um, ruling ideology, you try to change something, you try to keep something. So there's always this mixture of change and continuity. Um, however, it is in, if you think about this uh, from the perspective of a modern nation-state framework, you look at this completely differently. You want to define China very clearly when China cannot be defined very clearly. And you want to define Chinese or chinese very clearly. However, Chinese has always been a mixture of many peoples, many cultures. Um, it's a Chinese civilization was always uh, changing, uh, and uh, there are some traditional Han Chinese elements in there, but always integrate other influences into the Chinese civilization. So, now we can think of, about this again. China was part of the Qing Empire, ruled by foreign invaders and ventures. This is true, but now we, if we start to question what China was, then we have to wonder if this, this claim still fits. And now we can think about if it is right to separate these claims, these, these things, right? separate the Chinese civilization from its political structure, from its understanding, a moral political understanding of itself, and the geographical continuity, um, and uh, the, the sort of the, um, the relationship between uh, different peoples um, in, in, in the Chinese imperial history. Okay, I hope I spent enough time for the next one. As a person, so what's the answer to the question? 
<laughs> we can talk about it together. <laughs> Red Chinese incorporated some of this going beyond 1912. Have they uh, used some of these same themes? Have they claimed that they represent the Han or the Qing or uh, combination? How have they maintained this uh, idea of China? Yes, oh, well, yes, a very good question. So, first of all, we have to separate with the idea and the practice. So, we can just, you know, talk about the ideas. So when the Xing fell, um, when the, the, all these different uh, political leaders, military leaders, they were trying to come up with a, a, a structure for the new China. Um, they wanted to keep China um, unified, what we call China, <laughs> unified. Um, and uh, so uh, what they tried to do, so they abandoned earlier 19th century sort of Sino-centric framework uh, for the reform. Now they used to, to promote this kind of, uh, sort of um, let's replace the, 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 the chain with the truly Chinese um, uh, dynasty. And now they argue that we should create a republic, a Chinese republic that treats everyone equally and make sure we incorporate uh, the, um, the main ethnic group, uh, groups equally into the system, including the Manchus, including the Mongolians, the Tibetans, Chinese, and uh, and, uh, and uh, the, uh, the Uyghurs. So, um, and that idea sort of continued, at least uh, in the articulation of this um, uh, uh, official articulation uh, in the Republic of China, and then even in the uh, uh, People's Republic of China. Now it's not five main ethnic groups, but 56 <laughs> ethnic, uh, you know, ethnicities, uh, but that's still, uh, again, being debated by by historians, um, but they, they try to promote this uh, not as a um, Chinese uh, country. Well, because of this translation problem as well. So they're saying that we are one Chinese civilization, but then there, you have like Han Chinese, and you have Mongolian Chinese, you have Tibetan Chinese. So we're all Chinese, but there are different ethnic groups in here. We have different traditions. But all these things um, constitute, um, you know, what we call Chinese civilization. Okay. And to, to follow up on that, one of the first things you said is that you were Han Chinese. Yes. And so that made me wonder, <coughs> is this sense of ethnic awareness a source of self-identity, a source of cultural identity, and conflict in modern day China? Um, I would say yes. Uh, the reason why I uh, mentioned I was a Han, I'm a Han Chinese, is because I want to sort of admit that um, you know because I'm one of the you know the majority, mm -hmm. I think majority, uh, I'm privileged in a certain way. Although many times we don't want to admit because we privilege are not words, mm -hmm. right? So um, and uh, um, and and uh, uh, we 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 realize there are other you know. Ethnic groups uh, in our community, um, but I think it was just really um, so. When some events happen, you realize, oh, uh, maybe some of these ideals are not carried out uh, well in um, in the, what we call the uh, autonomous regions. These are um, autonomous regions, basically for the um, uh, areas where most of the population were not Han Chinese. So when some events happen, you realize, well, uh, actually the ideals are not being carried out well in, in, in that area. And also, um, I remember when I was in high school, I suddenly realized uh, that my friends who are not Han they could receive more credits when they took um, the college entrance exam. And also I realized that they were able to have more children than the Han Chinese in urban China. So many of us thought, wow, I wish I were a minority. Of course, that was politically incorrect. That, the 
right? Uh, because you all always want to claim more privileges, right? When you're young. Uh, but uh, but we, we knew that we are aware that there was different ethnic groups living in the country, and they were all in our communities, and uh, and uh, there were some misfortunate, um, I think, um, uh, ethnic conflicts happening all the, all the time. And I, when I was a high school student, there was some bombing. Uh, terrorist um, bombings in Beijing, and it's really scary. I remember when before I went, uh, before I dined at the restaurant, I would search the bottom of the table to see if there's a bomb. Mm. Uh, and uh, I didn't uh, want to take subway for a long time because I was so worried if someone would bomb the subway station. But that was many, many, many years ago before everyone started to talk about terrorism. But uh, we are aware that these things were happening at the time, and I'm, I'm sure that. Uh, I think minorities in Chinese they have real um, experience of ethnic discrimination um, in uh, in Chinese society. I think that's that's real. Yeah. Was the 1912 uh, transition purely indigenous, or were there foreign elements, were there foreign influences in it that they came to bear on that transition? Well, that's a very good question. First of all, you know, it was, this whole thing took place after. There were many foreign divisions already, and then um, and what is really interesting is uh, when the power was transferred from the, the empire to uh, the republic or these political leaders, they had all kinds of uh, foreign um, consultants uh, helping them come up with new ideas about how to create a new state structure, how to uh, create some kind of Western-style democracy. Uh, if they, they could um, maintain a parliament, uh, if um, they should adopt a certain model, or you know the uh, United States model, uh, the United States or Great Britain or or France, uh, uh, they have all these historical models to think about. But eventually, after some you know wars, chaos, and infighting, and they reach this compromise, uh, you know, with the structure they had eventually. So there were all kinds of, uh, uh, this whole event took place because of the uh, imperialist invasion at the time. And, uh, and also um, they were, all these political leaders who were greatly influenced by their foreign um, friends, um, intellectuals or politicians. And they thought they wanted to, eventually the Chinese model would be different from the French model or American model because they didn't really overthrow or kill the king. Uh, they decided that they wanted a peaceful. <laughs> of course, a lot of wars were happening already at the time, but this transfer of power was peace for people. I'm kind of struck in listening to your presentation, Professor, about some things <coughs> that um, <coughs> Kind of suggest American history. Um, was there a melting pot? You know, this concept that we like to talk about that America is a melting pot. And listening to what you're saying here, that question is somehow coming back to me. And also the, the use of maps um, showing uh, again with, with America, it's, it's, a, it's a Western expansion. And on the maps, um, even some of today's issues, uh, I wonder if you would comment, um, like, Tibet, it, is it or is it not part of China? And the Xinjiang and the Uyghur issue. Uh, I, I know, a lot, uh, I teach uh, Asian history at a high university, and I know a lot of Americans are kind of puzzled that who are these Uyghurs, or what is that all about? Um, the existence of Islam out there, um, and the importance of maps. And maps <coughs> can be so, you know, they could be the, the subject of a debate, like, like this current thing going on in the, um, with the islands between uh, China and Japan. Um, I wonder if others, feel this thing with American history, the, the melting pot and the, uh, the Western expansion. Yeah, so I think that's 
So I, I think we can all talk about, you know, how it is, it's interesting to me, this idea of not being called and the, it, how, how it um, operates in, in, in American history and then how it um, shapes Chinese history. Um, any thoughts? I was thinking that you know, I, I consider the concept melting pot a concept. Um, I think that our country is a mosaic. I didn't see that everybody got melted in. I think it's very individual. Similar to what you're saying about the Han, our, our have pride in who they are, but they still think they are Chinese. It's, it's believe, I do not think, believe that they are Chinese, as well as the Manchu to are proud, are proud of who they are, but they are Chinese. Well, I'm an African American, I am proud of that pride. I, I have pride in that, but I'm a, an, an American. So the melting pot becomes, as I said, a mosaic. Everybody gets melting together. We're all very individual with ours. And, and fitting that <coughs> individualization into the whole is is our task and it's ongoing. Sounds like that's what the same issue that Chinese have, fitting that their individualization into the, the whole of being. Yeah, where my thinking was going was India, uh -huh. because I see a lot of parallels between India and China. And one of the things that always impressed me about India was its ability to absorb conquerors. Somehow they were able to integrate certain elements of the conquerors, and then they conquered the conquerors through long cultural influences. To your point, I think a central idea here is the role of mythology. Because in India, and apparently I gather from what you said about China, mythology is one of those things that brings harmony and unity. Just don't pick it apart too carefully <laughs> because the myths are what keep people together uh, in otherwise stressful uh, times where they could end up killing each other. Your reaction? Um, I would agree. Um, I, I think, you know, of course, it, the distinction between fiction and reality is not as clear, and uh, fiction is reality. It could be reality, right? Reality could be fiction. So I think, I, I do think that um, what, well, actually, China, Chinese, if you look at Chinese history, it is quite, you can also see something different from, uh, from India, because Chinese language was a unifying factor, and uh, more so than India. much more yes. so than in India. So it's English that you know linguistically unified yes. India, but yes. uh, but in China it's you know the language, the power of this part, how the, 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 the myth, the narrative was written and and spoken, articulated, and continued in Chinese language. That's very very powerful, and that was continued throughout the imperial history. So language. Um, and also this ideology, Confucian ideology. Um, and of course, it was written and articulated in Chinese and in Confucian classics, written in Chinese. And it's very powerful because I skipped this because I thought I didn't have time, and this is what I do in my <coughs> research. I look at this Confucian moral political system. I call it moral political system because it unifies with everything. Um, from your language, the language, the, the classics, to uh, everyday life, um, everyday life, uh, and I think that really the, the the power of this 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 ideology and why it was inherited and developed in all these Chinese and non Chinese languages because it's so flexible. Um, it basically it imagines the states in uh, as um, you know uh, organized in, as a family and family in, in, uh, imagined like a state. So at the center of this is the concept of loyalty theory. It actually combines the political and social or familial of responsibilities and roles and all these ideas. And then when 
situation, situation is changing, and the system tries to adapt to the new situation. Uh, the system is trying to adapt to new situation. You find the system itself started to starting to reconfigure. Um, you know, the relation between uh, between different among um, different elements. For example, when in the whole system you have for emperor, you have officials, you have family, okay? and then you have moral critical division of labor. Who's representing what and who uh, take what functions in political negotiations in the, maintaining the social and familial order? So what happened in the Qing? I want to use Qing as an example here. Is that we see the Qing dynasty? It's a very, it's a very typical of the foreign uh, war and not Chinese dynasty. It basically maintained this Confucian moral critical system um, service. However, now the Qing emperors they themselves decided we're going to be to symbolize the moral example, Confucian moral cultivation uh, and enlightenment. And then the Han officials themselves who came into bureaucracy. They used to be the representative of Confucian moral example. So, because once you claim uh, moral cultivation, you have the political power. So, they decided to separate that. So, the Han officials actually from the 17th century were turned into bureaucrats. So, you see, this is an example of how this moral political system reconfigured itself. Uh, and the consequence of this in, uh, in the Qing is it, you know, it further modernized. The, the, the system, the Confucian system. Um, first of all, it sustained the appeal of the center. Okay, it, the center is even strengthened, and then, um, <coughs> and this separ separation of power, you basically deprive the officials, the ruling, the Han ruling elite, the, uh, the the ability to claim moral superiority and hence the moral political power uh, in in the political structure, and and then. Basically, just giving them the role as pure bureaucrats. So I think it's very modern uh, uh, way uh, to organize the governance. So see, this is how this Confucian system fu functions, uh, and it just allows different ruling houses to, to keep experimenting uh, and, and uh, while maintaining some continuity. And but it also allowed very interesting changes. But just to make one more comment. Um, I'm tracking with what you're saying. I certainly agree in the, every society goes through continuity and change. Um, so having said that, then what are the changes? What are the continuities? And I think you've identified two really important continuities yes. Yes. in Chinese culture, language, and Confucianism. Yes, yes, yeah. And, 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 and that's why I, I feel like because of this, uh, these two features, it's very hard to to really claim this, sort of uh, admit there's this genuinely distinct literary, artistic, philosophical tradition and, uh, and, and, and something very fictive of the political uh, continuity. I think these things were actually matched together in, in Chinese history. So, um, going to the question of Tibet, <laughs> um, I, as a historian, I don't, I, I try to separate these, you know, the intellectual discussion uh, and uh, my view on contemporary politics. I think there's a sort of practicality issue involved in contemporary politics. Um, um, maybe go to a map here. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know where to start. Um, I think it's important to realize that there is a reason why lots of these territories um, remain within Chinese, or either Republic of China or People's Republic of China. So when the Qing Empire collapsed, and then power was transferred to other leaders. Um, the late ruling elites, many of them aristocrats in Tibet, in Tibet, Xinjiang, and in Mongolia, they were negotiating with the political leaders. They were trying to figure out if 
they should say within this relatively unified, at least in name, Chinese Republic, or they should declare independence. So there were a lot of negotiations, negotiations happening at the time. So the results of these negotiations, I think, are also found, you know, um, because China has so many wars in the first half of the 20th century, it's including Sino Japanese War, part of World War II. I think many of these negotiations basically stopped, and the people just did whatever they could to basically survive, and uh, um, and then some, somehow, you know, basically collaborating with one another and, and then surviving. And then eventually, Mongolia successfully declared independence. And it was recognized as such. And then the Chinese People's Republic of China maintained its claim over the territories here. So um, I think I think this is a one century long process of negotiation and struggle. Um, I personally don't I cannot say what I achieved because I, I personally feel that um, first of all, if we use, we we use history to decide what we want allow people to do, or we you know um, we don't allow some governments to do certain things, then there has to be a standard, a uh, universal standard of being able to be applied to all the countries. I don't know if we can fight that universal standard. Um, on the other hand, I feel that we want to understand this historical process of nego constant negotiations and struggles more, more better in order to allow um, constructive conversations to happen, to happen uh, in, uh, in contemporary China or in any other countries that are also facing similar problems. So that's just my take as a historian. <laughs> no, I, I would just say that in, in talking with American students and, and some American people, some people are very, very emotional about Tibet and the Dalai Lama situation <coughs> and the publicity that Tibet has had in the United States with Hollywood getting into it, and a lot of emotionalism yeah. uh, arises. And I, I just discussed with some students, well, step back a little, I think somewhat what you're suggesting, you know, look what happened in the United States with our Western expansion, and the, uh, the places in the West, uh, look what happened to um, the Native American peoples who might be compared to you know, the people in, in uh, uh, West Asia. They, yeah, they were overwhelmed. To Xinjiang, there was so much violence. It, it was incredible. They were overwhelmed by the, uh, the westward, westward expansion of the, the growing United States. And that's somehow how I see what had happened there in China. But a lot of them people, uh, some people, really are emotional about to death and the Dalai Lama and so forth. Yeah, I, I, and I understand that. Um, so I, I feel that I, I feel that uh, the academics, uh, what, intellectuals and the general public need to be better educated and, and find a way to communicate better to help find a solution to this. And when it comes to Tibet, whether Tibet was independent uh, even in the chain, um, because Tibet's even a relationship with all these Chinese students is kept changing. Um, even the chain scholars, even our now new chain historians, they, they don't reach a consensus whether it was independent or not. It's just, you know, still, there's still a scholarly debate, and these <coughs> are a very, very serious people. Although they have their own personal views about it, they intellectually they try to study it carefully, and they don't disagree on how to interpret historical status of Tibet 
either. So this is very, very complicated. And these clinical stakes are so high. I feel that we have to be very careful about what it will be say and how we say it. And I said at the beginning, I'm a Han Chinese, therefore I have to be very careful about what I say and how I say it. Now I feel we have had enough violence and emotional, you know, uh, struggles and uh, all these terrible things happening in the past. Now we really want to, you know, make sure that we have construction, constructive and people and informed conversation about these things. May I ask what textbook you, you use for your students here in this class? Uh, I teach a pre-modern, um, pre Pre-1800s. Oh, pre pre and my colleague Christopher Reed teaches the half, second half class of that of that class. Oh. Yes. Yeah. And the textbook I use um, is uh, co-authored by three scholars, and now one of them unfortunately just passed away. Uh, one scholar of Chinese history, a, a scholar of Korean history, and a scholar of Chinese, uh, Japanese history. And they they do try to incorporate new scholarship on Vietnam on. Um, Asia into the, into the, um, uh, the, the textbook, and uh, these scholars are all um, American. <coughs> but I'm kind of fascinated by the use of maps and, um, you know, the kind of newer teaching where we use a lot of visuals. And the historic issues that can be focused on, on maps. Um, you know, a map from 200 years ago can be argued about now when people are trying to sort out these territorial claims. And these maps, especially the maps of Asia, are, are used. Yeah. And I know uh, maps related to the ocean, even. Uh, in this current issue about those islands, you see these references to maps. And uh, they become the subject of uh, the focus of the day. Now history even become, you know, become more important when we have this uh, territorial uh, disputes. Yeah, yeah. The question is, how do we use history? <laughs> how do we use history? What kind of historical claims we can all agree on to incorporate into our the discussion of our contemporary politics? Yeah. But my my students, they all. Because in my teaching, I, I, I emphasize the changing territories, changing civilization, um, and changing relationship among these different groups in, <laughs> that had, had resided in the type, what we call China today. Um, my students, they now, I think, they used to be used more strongly in the um, in one never changing Chinese civilization, uh, but now they sit in our conversations. They seem to pay more attention to the changes, to the flexibility of all these systems and people's ideas and practices. And we want to remember the good times when people could travel freely, like a Silk Road, um, when um, you know people just could freely migrate to another place to seek more economic opportunity and to just you know learn from one another and develop their own you know um, their own cultures. So in my teaching, that's what I emphasize. Uh, emphasize kind of the changes and uh, the flexibility of this thing we imagine as China and uh, the times when people didn't have so many territorial disputes and uh, conflicts and, uh, and how, how they approach their differences in, in history. That's what I think what my students are most interested in exploring these days. And I notice difference in, in my undergraduate students. just for a moment uh, with reference to the, the terrorist attack, what just portrayed as the terrorist attack in Canada Square this last week with the Uyghurs. Um, and comparing the 
U.S. experience, the Chinese, to a certain degree, the U.S. has survived, if not thrived, because its ethnic groups have been integrated geographically over the forces of time with internal migrations and so forth, as well as the elimination of the Native American populations, uh, to be sure. There's also been a certain amount of social mobility, so the members of all ethnic groups, with varying degrees between them, to be sure, have been able to achieve status and stature. Has that been the case in China, or are the minorities like the Uyghurs still isolated geographically, concentrated geographically, and denied opportunities for social and economic advancement? Again, as a Han Chinese, I hesitate to, to, to use what I've learned from the media. <laughs> um, Answer this kind of question. Um, again, I feel there's this, this gap between the ideal and the policies and the, the reality. I think the policy is to encourage, <laughs> to encourage these uh, minorities to um, to develop their culture, um, and then at the same time seek opportunities in not just their own. Uh, autonomous region, but also elsewhere in China, especially in a time when a lot of people move to big cities, more economically developed, developed um, areas. Um, but I, I think that has been a policy, an ideal. Uh, however, I, I, I also understand that people are concerned when these people were encouraged to seek opportunities elsewhere, if they were able to make their own language, their own cultural identity, and their independence, their you know, independence and autonomy. Um, and, uh, and so if the government should help create an infrastructure to do that, and if the government should do so, then then how how it should be carried out? And these are very difficult and because there are always power abuse, there's always <coughs> some, um, discrimination happening on individual levels and on collective levels. Um, and on one hand, we cannot blame everything on the central government. On the other hand, we have to realize there's widespread discrimination, bias, and uh, and uh, um, lack of opportunity for these ethnic minority people, I feel. So I think it's just as complicated as the problems in the United States. We're talking about African American community since mid 19th century, <laughs> the Civil War, we still, you know, African American communities still face the structural problems. And if we talk about social mobility, you know, there's so many still poverty comes African American. States, and when you know we, come, we have economic class, then it is the minorities who suffer the most. They're the blunt of all these, you know, um, problems. So I feel if we understand the complexity of the issue in the United States, then maybe this kind of understanding could be translated into our understanding of how complicated, how delicate, sensitive it is in China. Well. Uh, that um, I, I was in China and um, I marveled at how big the cities were and how, how at the time I was in Beijing it was 16 million. Well, I can't conceive the city with 16 million people. And that it, there was a lot of congestion and then how sparse the population in the in the rural areas were, and wondered why the more people who were in the rural areas weren't and wouldn't just uh, migrate to the cities, but was told that that migration is very controlled. You just don't leave the countryside and go to the city. From somebody in the United States where we have a, a less lesser population, and more movement, 
um, I'm thinking, well, how, how, what a tragedy. You can't move around where you want, how, how you want to. Um, but then I thought, well, if there's 60 million people in Beijing, people just can't, I mean, it's, it's unmanageable to have a million people from the countryside go to that big city. So, so the, the management of the masses and the management of the people becomes an issue when you have a large population, and it just can't happen. Um, it was easier um, in imperial China, because, well, first of all, there are fewer, I mean, but remember, the population exploded in the sort of increase to third in, in the Qing dynasty. So what they tried to do was to basically the Confucians believed that agriculture was the primary industry. So commerce, trade, everything else should be, be in the secondary um, industry, not as important as agriculture because the Confucian ideology promoted the idea of benevolent government. You still hear about it in contemporary Chinese discourse. Um, so it, because the majority of the population is rural and agricultural, they really tried to make sure the, the peasants um, they, you know, could survive and live a comfortable life, and that was had always been the ideal of the of the imperial Chinese uh, states. So it was so basically part of the Qing success was economic and political success was um, ensured by its expansion of the territory to keep sending people to these, reclaim the land and cultivate agriculture, um, and um, um, and, and of course there are also some for, forced migration um, as well. So in, in, uh, in China, uh, for a long period, in the Republic of China, for a long time, the population and the migration was controlled. And you have this registration system, very complicated, and this rural urban divide uh, that became such a problem in modern period, right? So, um, and then now I see this positive loosened. And then pe when people are can move more freely to more economic development areas, let new problems emerge. Like if they are they now they're subject to very terrible living situation in in big cities, uh, and uh, they live in you know in a basement and uh, ten people sharing a small room and it's expo exploited terribly by these factories. Uh, by these companies. Well, that happened people. also in the West. Yes, yes. So, uh, again, what I'm saying is, um, again, you know, if we understand the complexity of this class racial situation in the United States, you will be able to imagine like what complicated situation the Chinese government is, is facing and people are facing. Well, yeah. you know, and, and I, I do understand that, and I think one, one of the things that Exasperates or exacerbates the whole issue is the number, the sheer numbers of people that you have to manage. Yeah, the scale of the country and the number of people, these things do matter. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm sorry to say we've gotten to the end of our appointed time for today. Before we close uh, formally, um, just let me reiterate some of the things that Steve said at the outset. This Clio Society is an outreach program of the History Department. Uh, we in the History Department know that our primary mission is our providing world-class instruction of our students who come here paying tuition, as well as creating new knowledge through our research. But we also take seriously the outreach mission, uh, which is consistent with the Lane Grant legacy of Ohio State University. Many of our outreach programs are run through the Goldberg Center, which Steve acknowledged, and Dr. Dave Saley, Professor Dave Saley, is directing that center for us now. He's here this morning. He and I would be delighted to chat with any of you about our ongoing initiatives to reach alums and friends of uh, history in particular. We do have an emerging um, program in study abroad, which includes an undergraduate experience that focuses on World War II and its impact, and we've developed some alumni and friends overseas tours connected to that program. We'd be happy to talk to any, about, any of you about that. We're trying to move into new sort of progressive 21st century areas of instruction like distance learning and um, working with K-12 teachers to enhance public education in Ohio, service learning, internships, and so forth. And in many of those areas, we're finding it fruitful to have good contacts with alumni and friends. And we'd be happy to discuss any of those initiatives with you as well. 
if you don't have time to say this morning, I can slip you a business card upon request and we can uh, follow up by email and maybe schedule meetings or lunches or something like that in the future. Thank you for coming this morning. Please join me in thanking Professor. <laughs>